so now it's the uh, time for questions and ask, uh, com comments from the audience. Um, we'll take a, a few comments first and then let uh, Joel and Mick ask and then we see uh, how, how are we doing in terms of time. Um, so um, there are two uh, questions here at the front. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so I am Nora Lustig, Michael, you probably have heard of our work, which tries to have a holistic approach to the incidence analysis with all the caveats that you mentioned, and I cannot agree more with you that the approach, uh, Joel mentioned that it's important to talk about tax systems. I really think we need to talk about tax and spending systems. And I want to venture uh, an explanation, I think, of why people are so reluctant to actually accept the policies that recommend getting rid of uh, exemptions or using the VAT and then redistribute later. Because for a long time, the later was not part of the equation, uh, the redistribution part. You know, the f the fund for many years was advising countries to get rid of exemptions, punto, right? And in Mexico in particular, for a long time, the only thing that the uh, government was saying is the exemptions relatively, you know, they're progressive if you in, in, in their inequality reducing because of, but, but they benefit relatively more the, the rich. But they didn't accompany the proposal of trying to get rid of the exemptions with a clear indication that those resources would be used to compensate the poor. That's one of the things. That, there's been a loss of credibility for good reasons, I would say, unfortunately, but, but you have to fight that. Because I think the proposal is correct. But why is it a resistance? One is that. The second reason why the problem is there is because the subsidies or the exemptions actually are addressing a group of the poor that is very hard for governments to reach, which are the urban poor. Okay? And Mexico is actually struggling with that right now, in which uh, they, you know, done great strides in making progress with the now called Prospera. It just changed its name, Oportunidades and Progresa, a third name. But they can't really make it work in urban settings because it's very hard to target. So they're, what are they trying to do? You know, they're now they're going back to the discussion about using minimum wages. And that's where, that's where the issue of what you do instead becomes much more difficult. So I am, you know, um, interested. I mean, uh, the, 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 I had forgotten that the SNAP had this uh, tax exemption embedded in it. But, but there is, uh, I haven't read it, and I was going to ask you, this idea of having a personalized VAT, you know, which means somehow what you have here in SNAP, that you actually in, embed the uh, benefit as a tax credit, so to speak, to people who are already part of your poor population, but particularly thinking about the urban areas. If you do not come with a solution for that, then politicians are going to resist it for good reasons because the urban poor are much higher in the decile scale, they're probably fourth, fifth decile, but they get upset if you, can, if you take away that subsidy. So you have to think about a way in which that group gets to be benefited also of, by the reforms. Okay, thank you. Andrea Cornia. Yeah. I'm Andrea Cornia from the University of Florence. I, I have one question, I mean, one common question to Joel. I mean, I think that optimal taxation theory uh, perhaps uh, needs to be expanded so as to consider, I mean, when you deal with the, the so-called efficiency cost of taxation, well, another approach to look at it is to say, well, okay, I have to pay higher taxes, but then I will get a, a lot in return from the government. I mean, this is the Western European approach. People are more willing to pay taxes because they have a fairly good health care system. They have a basically free and high quality education. Then there are minimum pension guaranteed to everybody. So, so the, the, the efficiency cost of taxation that there will be lower, uh, lower labor supply, lower investment, uh, I think there are all these new theories of fiscal exchange. You give me this and I give you that. I mean, I have to pay you taxes, but then I get a lot in return. I lived five years in Finland. And here, people, the tax rates are quite high. And people do grumble, like they, they grumble everywhere else, but they, I mean, uh, tax compliance is fairly high. So the, the fact is not very high. And then the, the second point is that when, when are these efficiency costs kicking in? 
I mean, in Uruguay, the income tax in, during the conservative government had been completely abolished, the personal income tax. Then they, they, this has been reintroduced with reasonable rates. I think the maximum is be 20 25%. And then one of my PhDs done a study showing that the reintroduction has not generated any diminution or any decline in labor supply. So I think that the, perhaps the optimal taxation has to be has to evolve also a little bit in this direction. The second point is for Michael Keane. Uh, uh, many, many years ago, uh, Francis Stewart and I we did an article called Two Errors of Targeting. And we compared basically the errors uh, uh, of including, uh, let's say, the rich uh, through subsidies, through generalized subsidies. And then the errors that uh, you uh, have when you do transfer income. I mean, uh, transferring income, I mean, there is a major problem of identifying the poor. And so, uh, so when we summed up, I mean, I, I thought that the traditional problem was that uh, normally the, in those days the bank, that's why, not the fund, the bank basically uh, was suggesting, okay, no, okay, stop uh, generalized subsidies and replace them with uh, income transfers. Now, normally, uh, <coughs> if, you're, if you impose very restrictive identification uh, criteria, then you exclude a lot of the poor. And uh, you exclude, exclude, exclude a lot of the people. So what it turned out, in, in the, we examined about 10, 10 country case studies, Sri Lanka, India, and I don't remember the others, in which basically, if you value only the inclusion error, uh, you obtain uh, that this program is superior to the other. If you include inclusion, in, in, inclusion and exclusion error, then you come up that in some cases generalized price subsidy might have been superior. Particularly if generalized price subsidies are, let's say, like in India with the PDS, in which you do have uh, you subsidize broken rice rather than rice. Okay. Um, in the interest of time, please keep, try to keep your, your comments relatively short. So we, we take a couple of more, and then we'll let uh, the speakers to ask. Uh, Francois, Burkina. Thank you very much, François Bourguignon. Thank you very much for two very nice uh, presentations. Uh, on, uh, on the first one, uh, would it be possible, I mean, could you tell us a little more about the elasticities of the tax basis to the uh, income tax rate? I know that uh, you've done uh, very much work, uh, in particular with uh, Emmanuel Saez, on, uh, on, on this. Uh, I'm not sure that I remember well the, 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 the figures that uh, you, you, you reach. I mean, there's a range of uh, estimates that, uh, that, that you reach. But uh, if I'm not mistaken, when uh, uh, trying to apply this kind of range to an optimal taxation framework, then uh, uh, having uh, the optimal uh, top uh, income tax rate at uh, 60% was not at all uh, completely uh, 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 illusory. So uh, is it true uh, or not? I mean, what is the kind of, uh, what are the orders of magnitude that, that we, that we uh, can think of? And on the mixed presentation, I think that uh, your uh, uh, argument about uh, food subsidies is very, very strong. I remember a couple of uh, years uh, from now, I was uh, trying to do exactly the same kind of argument in Egypt, uh, and uh, presumably the bank was not really very effective in, uh, in getting these results. You're absolutely right to... Uh, to uh, insist on uh, the political economy aspect, which as a matter of fact is also present in the UK and also present in France. Uh, but uh, I think another aspect in uh, developing countries, and maybe also in, uh, in developed countries, is the fact that we are not always, uh, I mean, it is not always okay that a channel to transfer cash is available. And uh, if, in the case of Egypt, it would, well, it would be possible to say, look, we will be reducing the uh, food subsidy, but at the same time, this cash benefit that you are getting will be increasing by so much, something which would be possible in Mexico, something which would be possible in Brazil, then things might be completely different because people could immediately see that uh, they would be losing on the one hand, but they will be gaining on the other hand. Okay, and then one final question. Bruce? No, no, the gentleman at the back. Yeah. Uh, Bruce Barbary, University of New South Wales. Um, I mean, this, on the same question of the, 
the, the price subsidies. I mean, I think a key political issue is the question of commitment to the compensation. I mean, many countries, governments can credibly commit to making a, say, a cash transfer compensation in the immediate aftermath of an indirect tax change. But of course, typically, cash transfers are, are payments that get adjusted from time to time. Um, and so there's a question about whether people can believe that in the, in the course of many adjustments over many years, that additional payment will stick. Um, and so perhaps in countries like say, Australia and the UK, perhaps one solution is to think of institutional frameworks. Um, so for example, some sort of specially designated cash transfer which, which responds to this and which is set up with price indexation and so on as part of its um, default s formulation. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, we now let the uh, speakers to respond. So, Joel, do you like to go first? <clears throat> so, let me respond to um, two of the um, questions. First, about theory of fiscal exchange. Uh, there's no question in my mind that if you look across countries and across cultures and try to explain the extent of tax evasion, concepts like fiscal exchange matter a lot. Um, but the policy issue is not whether we can change Italy into Finland. Uh, we are, in most cases, when we're thinking about policy reforms, we're sort of stuck with the attitude people have uh, toward government and whether they uh, find credible and reasonable to think about, I give you this, uh, you give me that. And if we're talking about policy, the response to policy for a given attitude toward fiscal exchange, I think the evidence is overwhelming that deterrence-type theories uh, explain uh, evasion better than any other theory. I, I don't mean to say non-deterrence theories like duty and trust don't matter at all. But uh, deterrence theories are over, overwhelmingly explain, I think, um, uh, the, the determinants of uh, tax evasion. Penalties, uh, probability of uh, detection matter if we're talking about for a given set of attitudes toward government. To the question about the elasticity of taxable income, uh, it is true that Emmanuel Saez and I wrote a survey paper where we talk about the estimates, but we give a range of estimates, and uh, the two of us might be on the, uh, on the two bounds of the range, but I will uh, answer your question. So I think the, the literature suggests the elasticity of taxable income is between uh, 0.2 and 0.4. If you get, start thinking about 0.4, uh, you can easily get to an optimal tax rate that's up near 60 percent. Uh, but I'll stress a couple things. First of all, we don't, the margin of error is still pretty high. It's not easy to measure the elasticity of taxable income. Second, that there's, I think there's no question that the elasticity is different for different income classes. And in particular, I think it's higher for the high income classes because they have not only the ability to make real responses, but they have available to them a much wider range of avoidance, uh, in particular responses, but also evasion responses. So, um, you know, I am not convinced that uh, what we know about the elasticity of taxable income is enough for me to go to a government and say, you know, t move the top income tax rate to 60 percent and don't worry about the behavioral response. I, personally, I'm not there. Okay. Mick? Uh, thank you. Yes, no, maybe just to, um, <clears throat> to respond to, to the comments I've managed to write down in reasonably neat handwriting. Um, I think Nora's point about the, the difficulty, the, the kind of uh, inadequacies of past advice, I think, is, is a fair comment. And I think that's certainly something I think the funders recognized for a few years. I think it has been a problem that we send, just from our narrow perspective, that you know, we've sent a mission on the tax side that would say, you know, get rid of these exemptions and you can look after them on the spending side. The authorities then say, well, okay, thank you. How do we do it? And then we say, well, we'll send another mission to talk about that or that's not actually us, that's the World Bank. Or So I think that's true. And I think it's certainly something where we're trying to be better on. It's actually very, very difficult to do, actually. Um, so we've had a few goes at that. But just, just in terms of um, putting together packages, it's, it's, very, it's very hard to do. Maybe just to pick up a couple of the, th the th things here. I think on the, 
The point about fiscal exchange and trust in government, and I agree with Joel, so what Joel said, and I think that's also why, you know, I think another link we haven't made well is, that I just touched on briefly, is the link between reforms in uh, tax and spending and reforms and actually the management of expenditure, because that's also, you know, it clearly is a big issue in many countries, and it's simply that they don't trust the money is going to be spent in any kind of reasonable way, and I think we've really, we've barely scratched the surface, I think, in terms of actually and marrying, again, those two areas of work, I think uh, uh, both people like us and countries themselves need to, uh, need to work, uh, work harder on. Um, I think just to pick up a couple of just general issues on the, on the subsidies thing, um, which as we all know is, is, not, a, is not a new issue. Um, I remember Ravi Kanba at a conference once Somebody presented a paper on subsidy, energy subsidies, and he said, well, we've, we've all written this paper at least once in the last 30 years. Uh, the numbers change. That's it. The paper is the same, but the numbers change. We kind of, and I think that, that's true. But I guess there are a number of distinct issues there. One is kind of the availability of instruments to reach these, these various groups, um, which we can, we can talk about. There, I mean, there, I think, I'm always quite impressed by this Iran example, where this was just such an expensive thing. It was worth investing in setting up these ATMs, networks, getting people bank accounts, making the thing work. So if we don't have these instruments, clearly in many cases, the, you know, the, doing it is going to be pays for themselves many times over. And I think, you know, we, we see these, we do see these things, even in Egypt, I guess, is also largely a, a, an, an urban issue. But, you know, I think the, the, the availability of instruments, um, uh, you know, we shouldn't take as, ex well, clearly we don't take as exogenous, and the, the, I think there are things we can see countries doing. Um, I'm just sort of not completely sure that's, um, that's going to be a, a, a whole solution. I do think technology is helpful here, as I mentioned with biometric cars. You know, poll subsidies are very simple things to do. And again, this is, this is, what, as I say, this is what, what Iran basically did. Um, but that leads into the, the second issue, which is the commitment issue, which I very much agree about. And um, I think that was partly what I was getting at when I talked about earmarking, was the idea that, well, are there ways we can tie our hands that, that people will credibly... Um, um, believe, um, and I think the issue. The, I mean, again, the, the issue there is well. <coughs> that, I mean, just typically, uh, it has it has pros and cons, which I was trying to get to. It, it can be very constraining for your spending. Why would you like if you say, well, we're going to fund uh, healthcare through the VAT? There's no necessary reason why what you want to spend on healthcare should depend on what you raise from the VAT. If your VAT revenue collapses, you're going to find money from some other source to finance it. In which case, you're not really earmarking stuff at all. You're basically, you know, you're either overly constraining spending or you're basically lying to people about what you're doing with their, with their money. And, you know, we do see countries that have extensive earmarking um, where it becomes, a real, it becomes a real budgetary macro issue, the extent to which funds get earmarked. Um, having said that, of course, we should recognize, you know, we do earmark stuff. We earmark, social contributions are basically an example of earmarking. And certainly before I joined the fund, I had an academic paper saying that earmarking was a jolly good thing, uh, which I've reconsidered a little bit, uh, a little bit <laughs> since. Um, but, I, but I do think, you know, commitment is, commitment is a, I, don't, I really, don't have a, really don't have a very strong answer, but I, I totally, entirely agree that's, a, that's an issue. Um, did I miss anything? Though the personalized VAT, well, I mean, I think of that, you know, as I understand it, this is basically just saying, well, let's compensate people in terms of what we think their VAT payments would have been, which is the, um, which is the way that uh, the IDB people present it, which is really just a special case of some of the things I've been thinking about. I don't think it's... Okay. Thank you very much, both. Um, um, we still have time for one or two questions. Oh, we have uh, quite many, so uh, <laughs> the two here at, in the front, so let's start from those. Please keep it short, and uh, please also identify yourself. I'm Nicholas Ngepa. Uh, I would uh, like to ask Joel about the possibility of linking uh, uh, tax data to survey data for more comprehensive analysis. And I also wanted to direct a question to Michael about um, uh, the, uh, uh, how he thinks that the big informal sector in developing countries will affect the a possibility of, of uh, 
uh, emulating the British case for, for, for de uh, developing countries, especially of Africa, and compounded with co corruption and the difficulty of even targeting the right beneficiaries. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Finn, please. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Finn Tab. First of all, thank you very much for two brilliant presentations. That's very much appreciated. Uh, to GL, I mean, thanks for the messages from the tax community, the development community. Let's try and see whether we cannot come up with a series of messages from the development community to the tax community. <laughs> um, Mick, I, I'm, and, and maybe Joel, you, you might want to comment on that also. Um, I, I'm going to have a couple of observations based on uh, two country experiences, uh, Mozambique and Tanzania in particular, but I'm particularly going to f refer to Tanzania. Uh, the, the first is out of also being on the so-called Danish External Appropriation Committee. In other words, I'm on that committee which basically signs off on all Danita uh, programs. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was sitting in the meeting, and then uh, one of the trans conditions is getting the tax share up. And then sort of as, of course, I sort of sit there and reflect, well, but is that in all cases a good thing? I mean, you know. And then basically the response when I ask the question, well, why that specifically is, is well, that's because the IMF tells us that. Um, and, and I'm not saying that's right. I, I, I'm not saying that's right. But, but, but where does that sort of kind of thinking come from? And, and, and why are we so kind of crude? The, the, now, I'm, as you know, I'm also living in, in, in Finland. And the present uh, development minister of Finland is, is sort of in the same area. And he's right now reflecting on a policy where he would um, allocate aid in the following way. If countries increase their tax share, then he will give the aid. He will tie the aid to that. I wonder whether you had some reflections on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question here in the front. Uh, Gentleman with the white shirt. My name is S. Subramanian. This is for Professor Keen. I think you will agree that uh, the choice between targeting and universalization would be very much uh, a case specific uh, uh, choice. Uh, but I think it is worth pointing out, especially in the context of a country such as India from which I come that the general disposition in favor of targeting uh, has not always necessarily been particularly healthy, uh, with specific reference to the public distribution system for food, for instance. There is, first of all, the massive cost of dismantling the public distribution system and replacing it with a system of targeted transfers. Now, even assuming that the objective of collecting information is to dispel ignorance, nothing more than that, the biometric identification program in India has cost an absolute packet. I mean, it's been a hugely expensive endeavor, which does not reckon yet with the fact that when, when a government has discretion, or when there are agents of the government who have the discretion to, to, uh, to offer uh, uh, selective, to confer selective favors on people, there's also the problem of corruption and bribery. So you might have all the information that you need at your disposal and yet be guilty of deliberate mistargeting of resources. And in addition, I think one should also be uh, uh, somewhat sensitive to the, to the fact that uh, biometric identification is very often a thinly uh, employed disguise for um, uh, targeting illegal immigrants. So there's a lot of intrusive surveillance which, which happens under the guise of, uh, uh, of targeting. Uh, secondly, this, this, is a, this is a gentle question uh, which either of you could to respond to. It might seem needlessly controversial, but uh, I assure you that it's genuinely meant and asked in the spirit of uh, genuine inquiry which is that if the objective of a tax come transfer system is to eliminate uh, uh, acute poverty, then I think for most countries of the world, and certainly at the international level, uh, the aggregate burden of redistributive taxation is very small. 
that's the aggregate poverty deficit, say, as a ratio of taxable income, or the implementation of some sort of lexicographic maximum principle of taxation, would result in very small proportions of the population being taxed and relatively small proportions of their incomes being taxed in relation to the huge benefits which are to be obtained from eradicating mass poverty, which is, after all, a massive moral shame as well. Now, this is a reflection a little bit on our profession. Are we tending to go along with, with governments which refuse to get on with the job of actually eradicating this problem by getting a little too subtle and exquisite with the design of uh, uh, rather fine-tuned incentive-compatible systems, when perhaps what we ought to be reiterating again and again is to say, get on with the job. It's not such a, such a hugely difficult one as it's often made out to be. Thank you. Okay, I, I, I hate to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, try to uh, finish this, this, this discussion on the, such a wonderful topic as taxation, but I, we are running out of time, and, and I, I, I do need to give to, uh, the floor still to uh, Joel and Nick, so uh, please. Well, I uh, sense that I got the easier of the questions. Um, Take your time off. <laughs> <laughs> I think there was one directed toward me about the possibility of linking uh, tax return data to survey data. Uh, I, the answer to that question really depends on what country you're talking about. The rules about the privacy of tax return data are very different in different countries, um, not only about linking to other data, but what, making um, the tax return data in some form publicly available. Uh, more and more, in more and more countries, that's becoming possible for researchers to get access to some kind of uh, sample of tax returns data, tax return data, which uh, so which is encouraging. But there's no general answer to whether that can also be linked to survey data. But I will say that I think uh, making tax return data available to researchers in some form is a very important thing for democracy because it allows private non-government uh, people to think about tax policy, to come to independent judgments using the, the data that comes from, uh, from tax returns and other government sources. Well, wow, thank you. Now, they're very, very good, very, uh, <coughs> very, very hard questions. I don't have anything terribly smart to say on any of them. I think the first, there was the first issue about um, informality, uh, which I think we could probably have a whole separate session on, because I think, you know, the first thing I would say was, well, what do we actually mean by informality? And I think, you know, for, in many respects, when we think about the tax system, uh, you know, it's, it, we're really talking about compliance and non-compliance, and which comes under some of the issues that Joel was talking about, about, for example, where you, where you draw thresholds for people who, are in the, in, who should be in the system. I think many of the smaller traders, our standard, standard view would be that many of the uh, small uh, micro-type traders just shouldn't be in the tax system at all. I mean, there should be, you know, we have a, typically we tend to have a fairly generous VAT threshold and they're sort of out of the system. But I know I'm not giving you a, a very full answer because I think that would really take actually a full fall out. And I can send you a paper on that, actually. Um, on, on raising tax ratio, well, I guess obviously I don't want to comment on particular countries, but I think as a, you know, as a general rule, I think, or as a general impression, uh, I think certainly our sense is that many low-income countries um, typically will need to raise more revenue in order to meet their development goals. We know that aid budgets are coming under, under pressure. Um, they've done a generally a, a, you know, a good job in terms of building strong fiscal, bu fiscal buffers. So certainly I think the raising the tax ratio in, in many countries, um, you know, we would think is, is something to aim at. But having said that, I mean, I think certainly we're also um, at least as conscious at the importance of the structure of the tax system. So I think there are a number of countries, for example, that have less so in recent years, but you know, if we look back uh, to since the early 90s or something, there, there are a lot of countries that haven't done much in terms of the overall tax ratio, but have actually done a lot in terms of changing the tax structure, in terms of where the revenue comes from, which we might disagree, well, we would tend to say is a, is a good thing, others might disagree, for example, but the reduction in countries that have managed to reduce tariff revenue, replace it from other sources, we would tend to think have actually done quite a good, quite a good job. So I think we do, we do think the structure of the of the, uh, of the tax system matters 
um, at least as much. And I think, I think the point you were making about uh, the notion that aid should be conditional on some stronger effort in, uh, in domestic resource mobilization, that, I mean, that is, uh, that, that's certainly an idea that's around and I think is, is going to gain traction. I mean, we, there is, an, as you know, an empirical literature on what aid does to, uh, does to uh, uh, domestic revenue mobilization, which people have different, different views on. Um, but, you know, there, there are certainly people who believe that uh, particular types of aid actually have um, debilitated efforts to, to strengthen domestic tax systems. And, of course, strengthening domestic tax systems doesn't just mean, um, you know, the VAT. It actually also means developing a proper income tax. Um, so, you know, I think certainly when we, when we think about uh, advising countries, we're often thinking not just or even mainly of the overall revenue ratio, but of some structural measures towards what we would think of as, as uh, tax systems better suited to meeting macro and, uh, and, and fairness and efficiency objectives. Um, I thought I was, interested, I was interested in your remarks about the, the experience with biometric uh, cards in India, and I certainly don't claim to be an expert on that, and I'd be keen to learn more. I think I'm, I'm largely going by um, assessments that were done at um, Centre for Global Development, and they were, they were actually they took a rather different line. Their view was that actually these things have been really rather cheap. Um, but I, I haven't, I mean, I think, I, but I think it's an important issue because, you know, um, the mere fact of identification, um, let alone linking with other data sources, is, you know, if you can get it right, does seem to me potentially really quite powerful. I mean, if you can, just being able to pay a poll subsidy with a reasonable chance that it works is, 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 is a huge strengthening of, of instruments. Um, I like your phrase about needlessly controversial. I wrote that down, but I'm always in, I'm always in favor of people who are needlessly controversial. Mm -hmm. But I think, in a way, your point was also answering the, the point raised here in some sense, that actually, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of these things don't, don't take that much money and uh, just get on and do it, which is also true, of course, of the wider aid debate, right? I mean, it's not, we're not talking about much money in many of these, in many of these poverty relief areas. But I'm sorry, I don't know if that got anywhere close to... Hmm. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you once again, Joel and Mick, for this excellent talk.